Professor Daniel Rubinfeld, it's a great pleasure to, to have you for the next uh, presentations. Please go ahead. So I, I believe I have shared the screen. Can people see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. This is just a reminder for me uh, to know what I'm uh, when I'm speaking about. And, and as someone who has uh, appeared as an expert witness in litigation over over a long period of time, I should uh, just just say for the record that I have uh, testified uh, either in deposition or trial uh, um, uh, in cases involving uh, uh, cases involving Microsoft on the uh, Microsoft side, even though I played a big role in suing Microsoft when I was the Department of Justice. I have testified or been involved in cases both for and against Apple. Uh, in one case at the same time, different cases. Uh, and uh, and uh, I have also done work uh, for Google, although I've never testified in court for Google. So um, uh, all of those are, uh, are in the past, but nevertheless, I thought I should mention them. So I, I think I've seen kind of both sides of, of what's uh, good about uh, some of the bigger successful tech companies and also some of the problems. And uh, this, this leads me to, over the years, to uh, following conclusions. Uh, one is that uh, uh, as a general rule, ex ante regulation is a poor substitute for ex post enforcement. Uh, that is, I believe that a lot of the potential problems that arise with some of the larger tech companies uh, um, are really specific to the nature of their businesses and, uh, and some of their activities. And therefore the best way to get at those issues that are problematic is through case specific enforcement. And generally the courts, in my view, have done a, a fairly good job of handling those cases. And while I would disagree with a number of cases, uh, there are a number of opinions I could talk a long time about that I'm unhappy about. Nevertheless, I think uh, I think overall the courts are the right way to go at a lot of these issues, and uh, I have confidence that with relatively minor uh, but important uh, tweaks in the system, uh, uh, we should continue to work the same way we have. And therefore, I'm a little concerned uh, about litigation, particularly a number of proposed uh, not litigation, sorry, legislation, a number of the proposed. Uh, uh, pieces of, of legislation that are on the table. I'm, I'm concerned about them. I think they tend to be, tend to be overly broad <clears throat> and, uh, and would likely uh, kind of uh, be harmful to competition, not, not, not pro-competition. Uh, <clears throat> so I wanna argue just through example uh, that uh, case-specific enforcement is generally well-suited to handle innovation issues and uh, and can be supported by case-specific remedies. But of course there are exceptions. And, uh, and so I want to sort of talk about some of those exceptions. So some of what I'm gonna talk about uh, today uh, is really just illustrative of the main points I wanted to make. Bear in mind that I just wanna explain why, why each individual case really has its own uh, specifics that are important and therefore, and while generally I think courts handle these cases uh, pretty well, and uh, we just need to, uh, I would say, we need to give support, I would say financial and other support to both agencies so that they continue along the lines that they have in the past. Uh, and particularly, uh, not surprisingly, given my economics background to continue to support and develop uh, the economic work that these agencies do. I'm particularly concerned myself about what's, uh, what seems to be a de-emphasis on economics at, at the FTC. So moving on to, uh, to my next slide, I'm going to talk about uh, Apple, Microsoft, and Google today, because I know those three of the big companies well. But I just thought I'd put together this slide because I thought I, if people are listening want to take a trivia pat, test. You'll see that of the big, of the top six firms I looked at last year in, in market cap, uh, Apple, Microsoft, and, uh, and Google, uh, Apple slash Apple that are, are three of the big uh, six. And the question is, what's the missing company? And I just, I won't uh, ask you all to vote on that, but I, I actually uh, had to think twice before I got the answer. 
uh, and the answer is Aramco, <laughs> uh, the Saudi Arabia oil company. So getting back to Ben, getting back to the story about innovation, <clears throat> um, we could talk, I could talk for hours about, about what is innovation and what its import is. But I, 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 I just to paint with a broad brush, I would say I would distinguish between uh, what I think of as scientific innovation, which is the real creation of new products and product designs. And I'll come back to that, for example, I think uh, we can credit, uh, well, to some extent credit Steve Jobs with the iPhone as being some scientific innovation, we could debate that. But there are other innovations that some of these big companies have been involved in. Uh, but I would say actually more, more of what the big three have done is something closer to organizational innovation. <clears throat> that is, they, they've uh, both acquired uh, ideas uh, of others and adapted them for their own purposes. They've organized and improved internal processes, uh, management with its methods and so on. So they've been generally innovative in the way they've used IP, even though they were not Generally, I think the big three, I don't think of, with the exception perhaps of Steve Jobs, I don't think of them as the real scientific innovators. But innovation of any form is important and needs to be supported uh, and understood on a case specific basis. So uh, the other point I would make, which I think there would be a little disagreement about, is that innovate, successful innovation drives dynamic efficiency. It, it, it affects growth. And the benefits of economic growth are huge in terms of orders of magnitude compared to the static efficiency benefits that many of us, including myself, spend a lot of time uh, focusing on. Uh, so uh, it is important that the agencies continue to pursue appropriate cases involving innovation. <clears throat> uh, and as I'll mention, of course, the one I like to talk about is the one I was involved in, which was US v. Microsoft uh, over 20 years ago. If we look at who's doing the innovation, it varies a lot uh, by the industry, uh, uh, and uh, but I would say that uh, it's often startups and small firms that are among the real innovators, and we need to make sure as we pursue the case-specific approach I'm pursuing uh, that we continue to worry about whether there are practices that inhibit the innovation of these smaller firms. The fact that there are a lot of acquisitions involving small firms, uh, as well, is a mixed story. And, and part of the story is that the, the thought that one will be successful and be acquired could be exactly what drives innovation. So we have to be careful not to be paying with too broad a brush when, when we come down hard on companies that are doing acquisitions. <clears throat> uh, now, as I said, the big five have the various degrees been, been organizational innovators. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that, uh, bearing in mind that uh, the bottom line of my story, which I, which I you know, will talk, talk about very quickly, is that uh, uh, it's uh, innovation, which is, is really important and uh, of various kinds. And we need to be careful that as we go and go after some of these bigger companies, and some of which I think are have crossed the line in a number of ways, we need to be sure that we we acknowledge the fact that there's substantial IP that these companies have developed, and we do not want to discourage the kind of innovation that has occurred and will continue to occur, including innovation by these big three companies. <clears throat> so I'll go through this pretty quickly just to highlight. A few things that may or may not surprise you, depending on how old you are. So, uh, a Apple uh, Apple originally was created with a successful use of IP, uh, almost all of which was borrowed from Xerox Park. Most of you know that story, uh, and it was obtained by permission. Uh, it was brilliant on the part of Steve Jobs to to do that acquisition. Uh, What's less known is that the success of Microsoft as a company was due to the agreement it reached with Apple uh, to give Microsoft uh, uh, permission to, to, um, to have access to, to a lot of the IP that was affiliated with the early versions of the Mac. <clears throat> so Windows, Windows 1.0 was heavily licensed by Apple they got that in exchange because Apple was having trouble 
broadening its market beyond education and games. And so they wanted a Microsoft to produce a version of Excel. That license agreement led to Microsoft's success in the case that Apple brought against Microsoft. I was Microsoft's expert in that case. And uh, the court, uh, the, ninth, the, uh, the Ninth Circuit, correctly, in my view, uh, argued that Apple's claims for its, its IP were overly broad and Microsoft won the case. Microsoft went on to develop Windows, of course, highly successfully. Now, I later turned around uh, uh, and, and helped to bring the suit against Microsoft for extending, uh, to, well, not extending its monopoly power, but defending its monopoly power inappropriately. <clears throat> the people sometimes forget that Apple was in deep trouble back in, in the mid-1990s and that Steve Jobs came back to the company and created uh, the iTunes Music Store and, and later the iPhone. So uh, it wasn't that Apple always had the kind of uh, uh, growth uh, and success that it does today. Uh, a lot of it had to do with the fact that it, uh, it either acquired or developed its, its IP uh, uh, and utilized that IP appropriately. Um, so that's, that's a brief uh, version of the op Apple uh, history. Uh, more recently, there's been a lot of debate about the Apple App Store, and uh, there's been proposed legislation to, uh, to regulate the App Store. <clears throat> and uh, here, uh, uh, a lot of my sympathies, uh, which are not neutral, are on the Apple side, because I think there's tremendous IP that was developed by the, by the App Store. Um, and uh, I won't go into uh, these other tri trivia questions. You can think about these on your own. I didn't actually give you answers as to what the successful issues were, but, you know, but uh, there are real concerns about the App Store. Uh, and uh, of course we have uh, litigation going on now, <clears throat> but, uh, but I, my own view is that we ought to let the litigation proceed and let the courts evolve to decide this issue. I'm very uh, nervous about regulation, particularly that proposed now in Europe uh, to, uh, to regulate uh, app stores uh, in an ex-ante way. I think that, was, that legislation is likely to be overly broad. <clears throat> now, let me move, uh, move on to, uh, to Google uh, and I can back and answer questions about any of this, uh, this IP if you like. So uh, Google was uh, founded, uh, as we know, by Larry Perry, Perry Larry Page and, uh, and Larry and Ser Sergey, as we say, uh, back in 1998. And uh, it, Google was quite innovative, again, uh, to some extent, inquiring uh, IP as well as generating its own. Uh, and uh, I, would, I would give a lot of credit to the creation of the Android operating system, which as we know is the largest uh, OS in the world. <clears throat> Not all of that was done by its own scientific uh, work. A lot of it was done by, by acquiring others' IP. But again, I think of that as important organizational uh, uh, development by IP. And, uh, and the same is true of the, search engine, of the search engine. It wasn't all originated just de novo at Google, but Google nevertheless has developed the most highly successful search engine. Now, none of this, none of this says... Uh, Sorry, Linda. This says that uh, Google <coughs> Google should be left alone, and that it may not have it may have overexercised its market power. But again, I think in order to work these issues out, given the fact that that uh, the IP development is extremely important uh, for Google, uh, we need to actually work on these cases on a case by case basis. And broad based uh, legislation gets me very nervous. <coughs> so. Uh, just finally, just moving on to Microsoft quickly, uh, founded, uh, you know, was it 40 years ago, uh, roughly 45 years ago by Bill Gates and Paul Allen. I talked to you about, talk, mentioned briefly about Microsoft actually acquired MSS DOS. I actually didn't say it, it did acquire MS DOS from IBM. Uh, and, and it was mentioned earlier today in a, what, what, what exposed was a poor decision by, by IBM, uh, which took it out of the OS business. Uh, IBM thought uh, the, the world was going to make money on hardware, not software. Um, Apple sued Microsoft over IP, as I mentioned, and lost that case. 
uh, to Microsoft uh, comes back to 1998, uh, quite a bit later, and uh, uh, Department of Justice sued Microsoft claiming uh, Section two violation of uh, of its attempt to monop to maintain its monopoly on the uh, operating system. Uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the several successful section two cases brought when I was at the Department of Justice, <clears throat> uh, and I think that case uh, that case uh, really uh, was significant uh, as a piece of litigation. And uh, while it's true it did not make it up to the Supreme Court, nevertheless the D.C. Circuit opinion has had a big impact on the way we process uh, some process litigation. Uh, and I think it's had the right kind of impact. And uh, that case is a good example of how I think successful prosecution of, a, of an individual case uh, against the company, which was in many ways, as I've suggested, highly innovative. And, and by the way, has been extremely innovative as it's evolved away from, from its uh, OS business into a to totally new business model. But nevertheless, successful litigation can limit improper uh, overreach of some practices. And that's the way we ought to go. I think we, we have evidence of that. <coughs> that individual, excuse me, <coughs> that individual that's post litigation can be successful. So uh, I, I'm going to stop there. I could talk for that more time about why I'm, I'm nervous about overly broad legislation. And I could also tell you that there are specific areas where I do have concerns that we could make modifications in, particularly concerned about some vertical, uh, vertical issues that I think we could fix, but nevertheless, uh, ex post is the way to go. So I'll leave you with the uh, trivia question that everyone on the West Coast knows the answer to. What's, what do uh, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and Serve Again uh, all have in common? Uh, does anyone know the answer to that question? Um, if, you, if you've been out in California the way I have for most of my career, you would know that they all began their companies in their garage. So did you at Packard. Uh, yeah, that's true, HP2. So I teach my students early on in my antitrust seminar that it's important to have a garage when you buy a house. Uh, and I will stop stop there. Garage can be source of innovation. Um, right, so thank you so much, uh, Daniel, for, for these uh, very interesting uh, uh, comments and, and discussion. So we understand that uh, you will uh, privilege ex post enforcement as uh, uh, over this transformational shift to ex ante, either through legislation or through regulation. Richard, do you have a... Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm always happy to raise my hand. I'm, I'm going to ask you the opposite question from the one that you've done. I mean... I agree with you in general that when you start looking at the adjudication stuff, uh, the court results are pretty good. I would also add a caveat to that. I think they were in general better before 1950 than they have been in the last years. I mean, because remember, this is the generation that gave us Vaughn's grocery and brown shoe and a bunch of other stuff that I don't think you would want to defend today. Um, and I can't think you could find that thing. But what I, I'd like to hear you oh, tell me. Let's talk about Philadelphia National Bank. That takes us well, back yeah, to the yeah, well, yeah, well, well, that was Dick Posner. Yeah. And he uh, was the clerk who wrote it. That's be uh, before he evolved in other directions. But uh, yeah, I mean, he's, he's involved in many directions over many I give times. him huge credit for, for Philadelphia National Bank myself. Yeah, I mean, but I wanted to ask the following question Can you tell me or give me a couple of examples? Uh, of administrative decisions that were made, which you think to have been genuinely unwise. Um, that is, instead of talking about the litigation stuff about this, which you generally praise, you talk about the FTC enforcement part and figure what about that is the stuff that leaves you uneasy. Boy, I hate to... Uh... Oh, you could step on somebody's toes. <laughs> David Kappas, for example. Uh... <laughs> Uh, I think I'd rather uh, leave that. I, I'd rather take that under advisement. I, is there something, if you prompt me by telling me about- No, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out. I mean, I, I'm hard pressed to tell it, but I mean, for example, as the FTC vetoed some merger, um, you know, we heard, for example, when Adam talked about the, the uh, 
immuno grail situation, which I regard as an administrative mistake. It's they're too small companies to be a catastrophe. Um, but um, has there been any large merger that the government has managed to kill um, or approve that should have gone the other way? I mean, I, I, I'm actually genuinely spotty on, on what the history is. So if there's somebody else who is willing to, you know, put up on this kind of thing, I think it would be very instructive because when you're answering the compared to what question, I think you want to know something about the rate of failure on both sides of the line. I mean, I could, I could think of lots of different industries. Uh, one of the areas where I have problems with would, uh, for example, relates to ticketing. So I think uh, there is there some there is deal related to from Ticketmaster, a Ticketmaster deal, which I think was handled badly and uh, by DOJ, if I recall correctly, I would have uh, gone after Ticketmaster. Uh, and uh, where this is this is a deal that made with Live Nation, where Live Nation get to acquire Ticketmaster and, and uh, combine ticketing and sort of online uh, venues. That's mm. just one example that comes to mind. Uh, there are a number of vertical deals where I, I have, I tend to have problems. Uh, well, well, you uh, is that because you're upset with too many vertical deals escaping under the wire, or too many of them being shot down when they have all these efficiencies? No, too many are escaping under the wire. I I think uh, I think that uh, uh, a lot there are a number of cases where claims of, of efficiencies related to double marginalization are overstated yeah. and given too much credit by the agencies actually, um, and yeah, uh, and so and and also, of course, it's much harder to prosecute uh, vertical deals. And I think agencies, some both agencies, have shied away. They've gone after a number of important ones, which we know, but I think they've shied away too much from going after vertical deals. So I would, I, I actually, I can't tell you how to write any the legislation, which gets me nervous. But I do think that finding ways to go aggressively after vertical deals is a good idea. But I don't want to generalize because I myself have been involved in supporting a number of vertical deals. Uh, I, I actually, I just think that I have a lot of confidence in the economists, not surprisingly, and I think good economic analysis will help us distinguish the ones where the benefit story is really right and where it's not. And I can oh. think of this as another example, just in case I was involved in a, a case, uh, not a merger deal, but a case looking at the, the uh, uh, health insurance industry and looking at the the uh, mm -hmm. rules concerning uh, uh, Blue Cross Association of America. And that was a case where um, there were claims of benefits associated with certain <clears throat> certain uh, clauses in the in the uh, contract that designed by or the regulations designed by the industry that mm -hmm. I thought were overly broad and the, the court agreed. So <clears throat> Uh, and there were there were standard kinds of claims made about efficiencies, which I thought were overly broad, and the court agreed. Yeah, look, I, I take a somewhat different view about this. I, I can't quite figure out whether it's agencies are better or courts are better. It seems to me a lot of what depends upon what it is the ideological inclination of the people who are in power. And, you know, David Capos certainly would know this better than I, and I'm going to ask him to, is, you know, you change an administration and put different people in the same position, you get different governments. And so, uh, you know, to give you but one illustration, I mean, Lena Khan as the head of the uh, FTC is not the same as whoever the anonymous person was who ran this. I'm trying to remember who it was even, um, who ran it under the Trump administration. Joe Simons. What? Joe Simons. Yeah, but he was all largely invisible, as far as I can tell, given all the conflict of interest stuff. But, but any other Richard, I would argue I, I've known the heads of both agencies prior to Lena Khan. Yeah. Uh, in both Republican and Democratic administrations. And of course we've had disagreements. Joe, mm -hmm. Joe and I would have had disagreements. Mm -hmm. But the differences were not so were not that great. Uh, and uh, the the economists in mm -hmm. both agencies, most of whom uh, people like Julie been, were there for a significant period of time. So the 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 changes between between administrations until this most recent one i don't think we're that great and i agree with well, i would i would i would with exception i would say dan i think um the justice department under the trump administration was quite different also 
I think yeah. I think sort of the last two administrations have been sort of very different in different ways, obviously, um, from from sort of what what came before them. Sure, we uh, I tend to agree with that, and I would mm -hmm. somewhat seriously, but somewhat jokingly, point out that the problem is that we we passed the period where the five Berkeley economists were chief economists at DOJ or the FTC. And and then we brought in Howard Schlansky. And Correlation is causality, game. right there. Come on. <laughs> uh, how is, how is so we lost our them, we right? we at Berkeley lost our influence. I I credit that to be the whole problem. It's the Berkeley School we ought to be talking about. Huh? Yes, we can't tell. Yeah, but but I mean, also on the judicial side, I think you know, you take the D.C. Circuit. I could give you one panel, which is going to give you a rather different result than if I gave you another kind of panel. And so I, the way I would put it is, I think you were probably right historically up to about, say, 2010. Um, and then I think, in fact, the differences start to get larger. But they not only get larger in the one branch, i.e. the administrative branch, and not in the other. Of course, I think the gaps become larger in, in both cases, and that the level of polarization that you see now. I've never seen antitrust initiatives like the ones that are coming forward in the House and Senate today under any previous administration with any particular inclination. Maybe I'm missing something. David, am I wrong? Or, I mean, I just regard this stuff as way over, whether it's right or wrong, just worlds apart from everything that had gone on in government before this, um, before the recent time. And, and so I, the question is how permanent are the institutional differences may depend on how permanent the staff is, right? Mm -hmm. From what you're saying, it's basically you regard staff as an anchor against the political changes at the top. Isn't that right, Dan? Uh, yes, if you're speaking to me, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I do think what we're seeing now is is strikingly different from anything we've seen before, and I'm very very concerned about it. Um, mm -hmm. and if I, if I may uh, just ask a question, because uh, uh, in your definition of uh, innovation, you distinguished between the scientific innovation and organizational uh, innovation. Um, that startups can be the source of uh, scientific innovation, while larger company can be the source of organizational innovations. I was wondering whether you were not referring to invention as opposed to innovations. I mean, just to go back to Schumpeter's distinction between inventions and innovations, it seems to be that what you refer to as startup uh, are innov inventors, right? And it doesn't mean that they are innovators, meaning that they are able to commercialize and distribute uh, these inventions in the market, which is perhaps one key feature of a larger, uh, larger, larger companies. And one great uh, economic historian has demonstrated that the, the need for large scale enterprise to commercialize inventions it's Alfred Chandler, where he, 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 he explained uh, historically how inventors, uh, well, used large scale enterprise in order to commercialize innovation. So I was wondering whether your distinctions was not more- Yeah, I will, I will, uh, I, I will like, um, greatly accept your, your um, amendment to my story. I think that that's fair. Yeah. Uh, a fair right. deeper characterization and also i should say uh, this was pointed out i think by scott or someone earlier uh these the big three i'm talking about invest a huge amount of money in r d so it's not like they aren't mm -hmm. doing some what i call scientific uh, you know, we call it invention or innovation <clears throat> uh, yeah the main point is that the story is is very complex mm -hmm. and uh we we just need to be careful about uh going after uh, companies yeah. that have so much IP that they've developed, uh, that doesn't mean we should give them a free ride. And, that, and uh, you know, when we sued, when, when I was in the government and we sued Microsoft, Microsoft led off with an IP defense, which turned mm -hmm. out to not, not be, I wouldn't say not be appropriate, but just had no really significant merit in the case then proceeded on grounds that didn't primarily relate to IP. But it was not surprising to me uh, that Microsoft led with that defense because uh, we need to be very wary about uh, about uh, jumping in when there is important IP, IP involved. <clears throat> okay, I think we're time out, right, Orion? Yes. Uh, Who's up next? Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. Yeah. For You're welcome. Patience. Thank you.